screen. Anyway, I just remind everybody, stay, you know, you're going to stay muted. Dorothy's got you muted and she'll monitor it to make sure you stay muted if you're not talking and, and uh, don't share your video just to save our bandwidth. Uh, just so everybody knows the meeting is being recorded, so we'll have a link for YouTube. Uh, if you want to ask questions or make comments, use the chat feature. Uh, Sam can tell you how he wants to do that otherwise during his presentation if he, if he wants. Um, Use the view speaker feature. I don't know that it matters, but what, anyway, I'll monitor the chat and answer questions or comments, <laughs> interrupting the speaker if I need to, to get responses. So we are ready to go and I'll turn it over to Abby. Okay, well, welcome everybody um, to the uh, July uh, monthly meeting that Sam has graciously provided with us uh, a week late, but we're all here. So it's going to be fun. And um, hope you are all staying cool in this terrible heat. So that's not fun. Um, let me introduce Sam. Um, it's Sam Konishnik. He's an urban wildlife bi bi biologist with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and he served the east side of the DFW Metroplex. Um, you may remember Sam from his presentation on Moz back in November of last year, and you can still view that on YouTube. It's still up there. So uh, Sam is very informed and very entertaining. He holds a master's degree from Tartan State University in Tarleton, Texas. <laughs> Sam, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you jump in there. So thank you so much for coming. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I hope you all can hear my voice. All right. Can you hear me? Um, I'm outside right now. Uh, I do have to say right off the bat, thank you so much for your flexibility in this. Um, I put my guard down when it comes to COVID and I was getting comfortable with not wearing a mask and uh, the germ put me in my place. And uh, just hope that you all are remaining extra cautious and safe uh, these days. Just we're not through with this just yet. Uh, and it definitely grabbed me. So um, I was doing pretty rough last week. Uh, so I wasn't able to present, but now I'm doing a lot better, occasionally coughing. So the virus is still trying to find ways to move around. So I'm actually being very careful. I'm outside right now doing this presentation. So again, thanks so much for your flexibility and please remain safe and uh, keep your guards up because we're not through with this quite yet. So I'm going to share my screen right now. I hope that you all can see that all right. Uh, again, Abby, thank you so much for the, uh, the invitation. Abby and, and Joel, thank you for the invitation on talking about a critter that I'm pretty crazy about. I, I've really started to become quite fond of these little insects and they're, they're definitely worthy of appreciation. So I'll be talking today about dragonflies and how pretty much how amazing they are and why we should be thankful that they exist. Uh, again, my name is Sam Kieschnick. Uh, if you're curious about how to get in touch with me, there's my email. I asked the state for the longest possible email address and they gave it to me. So there's my email address. Very active on iNaturalist too. I'll talk about that in a second. My username is Sam Biology. Um, I'll be kind of watching some of chat, so if you have any questions, be sure to toss them into, into chat. If I don't get them right at the moment, I'll try to hit them at the very end of the presentations. But let's jump into this. Uh, dragonflies. Have you seen dragonflies before? And actually, let's make this kind of interactive. If you can uh, access your uh, in reactions. If you have seen dragonflies lately, if you've seen dragonflies this past week or this past month, go ahead and put your hand up. Uh, I want to see just how many folks have seen dragonflies lately. Good. Got a, quite a few folks that have seen dragonflies. And tis the season for dragonflies. Summertime, as miserable as it may be for us, 
it's prime time for dragonflies. I don't know if they love the heat. Maybe they're just good at tolerating the heat, but they are definitely present uh, this time of year. Um, another show of hands, how many of you have seen these critters lately? Yeah, you probably have seen these. You probably have heard these. You probably have made voucher specimens of these as you slap them when they get onto your body. Yeah, they are, they're present too. This is their season. And there's a great book called um, Man's Deadliest Foe. And it's all about mosquitoes. And as you probably are aware, mosquitoes, they're vectors for a whole lot of viruses, for a lot of microbes that can impact us. And they're pretty pesky. They're just pesky. It makes a lovely summer evening less tolerable, not just because of the heat, but because of their presence. Dragonflies are the ultimate mosquito killers. I'll talk about their adaptations in killing mosquitoes, but that's the main point. Dragonflies are ultimate mosquito killers. Some of you may be familiar with this tool, and this is a tool, a bug zapper is the name for it. One of my least uh, favorite modern inventions is this thing, and when we put it up, when we hear the zap, we may think that we're getting a mosquito, but in reality, these are not effective for mosquitoes at all. When we put them up, this is at night when mosquitoes aren't very active, they're more active at dawn and dusk. That zap that we hear is probably getting one of the less impactful or at least annoying insects. They're getting the moths that I talked about last time. They're getting the little beetles. They're getting the non-biting midges, all of these other things. But 99% of the time, they're not zapping mosquitoes. So you may think, okay, I've got some bats. I've even got a purple martin house up here. Perhaps they are eating some of our mosquitoes. Well, you know, I hate to break myths to, to folks, especially some of these, but bats and purple martins really don't eat a lot of mosquitoes. There was a fascinating study done in the 50s or maybe early 60s about bats and how many mosquitoes they eat. And it, it showed that a bat would eat like 100 mosquitoes in an hour or in a minute or something like that. Well, when you read that study, these bats were in captivity and all they were given to eat was mosquitoes. So they didn't have anything else to eat. So yeah, they're going to eat a bunch in captivity when that's all that they're given. The reality when people have studied the bat droppings, the feces, mosquitoes make up a very, very small proportion of this. Mostly bats are going after moths and beetles and other nocturnal insects. The same thing with our purple martins. You know, if you're hungry, you're not really going to eat just a french fry. You're going to go for the burger. So purple martins are eating a lot of other insects. Maybe they're eating a couple mosquitoes, but it doesn't make up a large proportion of their diet. Dragonflies do. They eat, and you know, I want to say that they love mosquitoes, that mosquitoes probably taste great. Maybe I'm throwing on some of my own emotion on that, but they are the ultimate mosquito killers. So let's go a little bit into the weeds of, of this. The insect order for our dragonflies and damselflies is odonata, and od, or odo, or dawn actually, means teeth. And the early, early entomologist, when they were trying to separate out all the groups of insects, they noticed, they noticed some of the jagged edges of the mandibles of, their, of the dragonflies. And they thought that they looked like teeth, so they gave them this name, Odonata. And we've kind of just stuck with it. We sometimes call this group the Odes or the Odinates. Just a couple other common names for them. Around 6,000 species of these globally 
on all the continents except Antarctica. You may have heard this, a damselfly or a dragonfly. And they're both odonates, they're both in this order, odonata, but there are some little differences between these two groups. And let's talk about those. We'll look at the dragonflies, the typically the larger ones, the bulkier ones, the stockier ones first. They are usually larger, stockier. I want you to look at the hind wings. So you'll see that photo of this widow skimmer that's spreading out its wings. The hind wings are typically broader at the base. So they're a little bit different shaped than the fore wings. So their pairs of wings typically have different shapes there. The eyes, those big compound eyes are typically closer together. And when they're resting, they rest usually, not all the times, but usually they rest with their wings out at rest. These are the dragonflies. We can compare and contrast that with the damselflies. Usually they're more small, slimmer, more slender. Um, the wings, their four pairs, of, or their two pairs, their four wings are the same shape. May not be the exact same size, but they're the same shape. The eyes, kind of like a hammerhead, they're a little bit further apart. And when they're resting, typically, not always, their wings rest along the body. The life history of these critters is fascinating. They are predators at all stages of their life, and they're eating mosquitoes at all stages of their life too. We'll start out with the eggs. With dragonflies and damselflies, with odonates, they have to have some aquatic stage. So they are um, amphibious at part of their, their life cycle. The eggs are typically laid near or in the water. Here we're looking at two uh, mating dragonflies. These are common green darners. And they are, the female has her abdomen down into the water. The male is holding on with his claspers onto her neck. Very romantic. And she is laying those eggs into the vegetation. Sometimes their abdomens actually will have little serrated edges. And they'll chisel those eggs in the, into a, the aquatic vegetation. Other times, females will just fling them into the water. It's kind of interesting too. Uh, you can sometimes see this on our cars. Sometimes a dragonfly gets tricked by the, the glare of our cars, especially a fresh, freshly waxed car. And she will try to lay eggs and even fling eggs onto the hoods of our cars sometimes. Obviously those eggs don't make it, but fortunately there's a lot of uh, dragonflies out there. The aquatic stage of dragonflies, fascinating. Uh, they have incomplete metamorphosis, so they don't have the, the pupil stage or the larval stage. We sometimes call this the nymph stage or the naiad stage. And this is a little bit of nightmare fuel, but they have this extendable mouth. So they have this mouth, this um, this labrum of this under lip that they will extend out and grab onto uh, little other critters that are, are swimming around in the water, mosquito, pupa, and larva as well, or tadpoles, minnows. They'll grab them with that extendable uh, jaw, bring it back to the mouth and nibble on them. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. But they do have to have this aquatic stage. These can live in some cases, years, years and years and years, they will live in water. For a lot of them, it's more of a seasonal thing. They'll live as the naiad stage for a season and then the adult stage after that. You probably have heard some cicadas lately and maybe even seen some of the cicada shells. When I was a little kid, one of the things I loved to do is collect cicada shells and then put them on my shirt. And I would spend all afternoon collecting cicada shells, the exuvia of cicadas, and I would put them onto my shirt. If you have kiddos or grandkids, do that with them. Great, great fun. It's 
the same sort of mechanism that a cicada has when it emerges from the ground up to a tree to develop into the adult. Well, with our dragonflies, they're going from the water up onto the aquatic vegetation and they are um, emerging as the adult. You can see the stages here. And another interesting thing too, if you're able to find a cicada shell, and I hope you know what I'm talking about, those cicada shells. If you see the one, I want you to look at it closer, sort of break it open, and you'll see these white strings, these little white strings. Those are actually the tracheal tubes of the insect. So when it sheds its skin, when it sheds its exoskeleton, those little tiny strings actually go from the inside of their breathing tubes out. So there's a challenge for you. Look for some of those cicada shells or dragonfly shells and look for those little uh, strings. Those are the breathing tubes, the shell or the skin, the exoskeleton of the breathing tubes as they emerge. As it goes with a lot of animals, one of the purposes of being an adult is finding a mate, finding that the love of your life, perhaps. Uh, in the case of dragonflies, they're pretty protective of their mates. The male has unique claspers that he will hold on to the female and actually she'll take the abdomen and grab some of the sperm of the, the male the whole time he's holding on to her. As she is laying eggs, the male will either remain holding on to her or will patrol her as she lays the eggs into the aquatic area. So it is a, a protective relationship, I guess you could say. Let's look at some of their adaptations for hunting. And again, they are the perfect, they're the perfect killer of mosquitoes. So let's look at some of these adaptations together. First of all, you'll notice that the, the legs of our dragonflies are different sizes. So their hind wings are, are, I'm sorry, their hind legs are a little bit longer than the forelegs. If I was with you in the room, I'd ask, why is that? And the reason that we think for this is that their hind legs actually work like a net. So as they fly around hunting on the wing, they'll grab things in mid air and grab them with their hind legs. So they're kind of flying around with this big net of legs. You'll also notice lots of little spines on the legs of our dragonflies. These just add surface area as they're flying around, hopefully catching some mosquitoes. It's okay if you get lost in the eyes of a dragonfly. That is well worthy of this venture of getting lost. Amazing structures. If you probably, you probably know about insects that they have compound eyes. So all of their, their large eyes are made up of lots of individual lenses. In the case of dragonflies and damselflies, monstrous eyes, monstrous compound eyes, tons of unique lenses that they'll have to form images. But not just that, but they're actually able to see the world in different shades than we can pick up. So we, and I don't want to get too much into genetics, that's my background is genetics, so I'm fascinated by this stuff. But we have three opsin genes, trichromatic chromatic vision. With our dragonflies, they'll have 15 to 33 opsin genes. All of this means that they can see the world in pretty amazing ways. So their vision, they can see shades of colors that we can't pick up. Some of our dragonflies migrate too. You know, the monarchs get the credit for, um, for flying around from Canada to Mexico, but our dragonflies, some of our dragonflies can do this as well. One of the big ones is the common green darner. This one, you can see the picture in the middle of that circle. It actually moves from Canada to Mexico and south as well. So they're able to migrate around. 
And much like our monarchs, it's the grandparents that do that movement. So they'll go 400 miles in one stage, lay eggs, reproduce there, have their, their life stage, the complete life stage there, and then migrate another 400 miles south. So pretty tremendous migrational patterns that these have. If you haven't noticed, it's hot outside. Yeah, it's hot outside. And dragonflies actually respond to that heat too. They do this, I think this is an advanced uh, yoga pose called the obelisk pose. So to reduce the surface areas, they will stick their hiney straight up in the air, much like the Egyptian obelisk. And you'll see this sometimes, especially on a hot day, like the past couple months that we've experienced. So let's look at some of our dragonflies and damselflies that are common in Texas. If you're into this stuff, there's some great resources. I'll talk about those in a little bit. In Texas, we have around 160 species of dragonflies. Let's look at some of these. And I like, again, I love dragonflies, but males and females in a lot of our dragonflies look different. We call this sexual dimorphism. So they might be different shapes and sizes, but typically they're more different colors and shades. In this case, we're looking at the Eastern pond hawk. And the Eastern pond hawk, the female is green and the male is blue. So you can see the female on probably the left side of your screen or depending on how you're looking at it. Um, the female has the uh, green abdomen, start of the abdomen and thorax and head, and a couple white stripes there too. And the male is more blue. Very, very pretty dragonfly. And this is a, an abundant one that we have here in the Metroplex. I talked earlier about the common green darner. One of our larger dragonflies, this one is a definitely a larger dragonfly. They don't always sit down. They can be kind of patrolling a pond or patrolling a drainage ditch or a stream. The male is typically a little more vibrant than the female, but you can see the male holding on to the female in this picture as she lays eggs. The blue dasher is another common dragonfly. But again, let's not, um, let's not gloss over the commons. Uh, when I was meeting with a, a, a couple that was in England, and we were down in the valley for a birding festival, and they were from England. They said, oh, we saw the most magnificent bird today. It was bright red. This was a cardinal. And I'd say, okay, yeah, we have cardinals here, and it's a very common bird to us. But to them, it was a magnificent, exotic species. The same way with some of our dragonflies can be very common to us, but extravagant to people that may not see them regularly. With our blue dasher, we have our female that has a few more yellow shades in her body and the male is more blue. The common white tail, the female has a few more bands in her wings. So in some cases, the sexes have different uh, um, colors or patterns in their wings. This is the case with the common white tail. It's called the common white tail, well, because the male has a very white tail, but no white in the wings. We can compare that with one of our next ones in just a second. The female has several bands in her wings. This is the one that we'll compare it to. This is called the widow skimmer. And I also, I love the names of dragonflies, the blue dasher, the common darner, the eastern pond hawk, the widow skimmer. Really cool, fun name, uh, common names for these. With our widow skimmer, you can see the female of this one also has some yellow. But if you look at the wings, you can see that the male widow skimmer has some white in the wings. So some white band in, bands in those wings. We can compare that with the common white tail that lacks the white in the wings. The widow skimmer also has a whitish tail, so the white tail isn't really distinct of these two, but if you look at the wings, you can probably tell the two apart. And then some of them just vibrant colors. I mean, a lot of them have vibrant colors, but this is one in particular called the flame skimmer. We have another one called the neos neon skimmer that looks very similar to this, but you can see the, the flame colors of this. 
they can be quite defensive or territorial where one finds a perch and it won't let any other dragonflies get near. One of the things I love to do is I will sit by a, a pond or a stream or a drainage ditch and I'll just watch. I'll just watch the dragonflies fly about. It's very relaxing as they're fighting for their territory. And then one of the last dragonflies that I'll talk about is just a really pretty one called the Halloween pennant. And this one, the males and the females look somewhat similar, but look at those wings. I mean, just incredible. Really, really pretty that, that these uh, organisms are. So we looked at some of our dragonflies. Now let's look at some of the damselflies. We have around 77 species of damselflies. Again, just as a reminder, the damselflies typically are a little more slender. They have the same shaped pairs of wings. The eyes are a little bit further apart too. Some of our dragonflies and damselflies won't necessarily be found near water. Some of them venture out to the fields, to the prairies, to the forest to find some prey or to find mates. In the case of familiar bluets, I find these a lot of times in lawns, in prairies, in fields. So not necessarily close to water, but they're getting some of the food, some of the other bugs that are found in those areas. You can see in this one, hopefully, the wings at rest along the body. Mm -hmm. Our powdered dancers, here we have a male holding on to the female. With our powdered dancers, I find these close to a, a stream that's flowing. And I know right now not many streams are flowing, but if you can find a stream that's flowing or has a little bit of movement, you're probably gonna find some powdered dancers dancing about. The fragile fork tail is another fun one. I find these close, close to water in some of the sedges and the rushes nearby. With this one, you can see on the thorax of it, it has what looks to me like a green exclamation point. You can maybe see it right there. The green exclamation point, this is how I remember the name, fragile, fragile or fragile. So exclamation point there. The ebony jewel wings. These are a little bit more of an East Texas, Eastern United States critter, but if you're familiar with the place Leela, Lake Louisville Environmental Learning Area, you can see these uh, quite abundantly in some of their forested streams. The female of our ebony jewel wing has these little white marks on their wings. I didn't get into this. Those are called pterostigmas. They're specialized cells that help the dragonfly balance as it's flying around, but she has these bright white ones as opposed to our male. But definitely you can see the, the, the reason for the naming of ebony. They are worth their weight in, in that gem. And the, the neat thing about biology is all the gray. You've got the black and the white, the rule followers, and they're all the rule breakers. In this case, we got a rule breaker. This is a damselfly. Uh, this group, the spread wings, when they're resting, they'll keep their wings uh, spread out like that. But you'll see the same shape on their pairs of wings. I bring up this question a lot. Who cares? Who cares? Yes, they're fascinating. Yes, they're interesting. But who cares about dragonflies? What do dragonflies show us? They'll hunt our, our mosquitoes. That's a great, great thing. We like that. They're part of the balance of the ecosystem, but they're also bioindicators. They're indicating that there is aquatic vegetation and quite a bit of diversity of aquatic vegetation in the, the um, water in that aquatic body. So it tells us that there's aquatic vegetation there to sustain uh, invertebrate populations that are fed are fed upon by these dragonflies. So you can tell the water quality by the diversity of dragonflies and the species of dragonflies too. A really interesting paper looked at, at, this, um, at the species diversity and correlated it with the abundance of uh, dragonflies. And I'm sorry, I'm, out, I'm presenting outside so you may hear uh, 
the trash folks <laughs> coming <laughs> right now. So you may be into dragonflies. How can you get deeper into dragonflies? There's some great websites for this. One of them is devoted just to dragonflies. It's called Odonata Central. You can document the species of dragonflies in your neighborhood, in your county, in wherever you are. You can take pictures of these. You can upload your data here too. I mentioned this when I talked about moths uh, last year. And it's one of the things I'm crazy about. I love iNaturalist. It is a, a citizen science community. It's a tool where you can document the different species of weeds, of birds, of bugs, of dragonflies, of slime molds, whatever you see in an area, you can observe it on iNaturalist too. And you can also get a filterable field guide of the dragonflies. If you're old school, if you want to do an actual field guide, there are some great ones for Texas. We have damselflies of Texas and we have dragonflies of Texas. And then the combination of the two. John Abbott did all of these books. Next time you're at Half Price Books, a very dangerous place to be. But if you're at Half Price Books, you might see one of these. Pick it up. It makes a great gift for a dragonfly lover. If you wanna to try to catch a dragonfly, it's hard. They are aerial uh, masters. So they are masters of the sky. So it can be hard to catch a dragonfly. I will use nets, huh? I've got one right out here. I will use a lovely little net like this to catch a dragonfly. And if I had a nickel for every time that I missed a dragonfly, uh, I'd have a pocket full of uh, coins, I guarantee you that. It can be very, very challenging to catch these. But if you're lucky enough to catch one, then you can start to see some of these shapes and structures up close. I do this all the time when I catch a dragonfly. I'll grab it, I'll look at it, and I'll look at it closely. And again, it's okay to get lost in these eyes. It is well worthy of appreciation, those giant eyes that they use to catch their, their food, their meals, and also to see uh, the ecosystem. They'll see the entire environment in ways that we don't. So you thought that this might just be a fun uh, presentation without any homework. Well, I'm gonna give you some homework here. I'm gonna extend a challenge for you. My challenge for you is to go outside, and I know that in itself can be a bit of a challenge during summer, but the first part, go outside and try to find at least five different species of dragonflies or damselflies this week. So I'll give you a full week for it, a full week to complete your homework assignment. Go to a place, if you have a pond or a creek that may still have some water in it, uh, drainage ditches, even those are our habitat for our dragonflies. I challenge you, to go to those places, maybe sit down for a second, watch, look around for some of the different dragonflies, photograph, document these if you're able to. It can be hard to take a picture of a dragonfly with your phone, but if you're patient, if you have a little bit of patient, if you maybe find a, a resting spot for the dragonfly, they'll return to that same spot and you might be able to sneak up and grab a picture of them. If you do this, and if you're active on iNaturalist, tag me, tag me so I can see that you, that you did your homework. Um, but I'm not gonna be double checking you here. The main point is just to engage with nature. Despite it being another 100 degree day, nature is still present. It's still surviving. It's still thriving, even in our urban ecosystems. It's just waiting for us to engage with it. And I find a lot of, uh, rest and relaxation by doing that. And with that, I would love to address any questions that you may have on dragonflies. Again, if you're scared to ask them in person uh, via the chat or whatever, you can send me an email. Again, my username or my uh, email address, my name, Sam Kieschnick at tpwd.texas.gov. Very active on iNaturalist. You can tag me with the ampersand and my username 
of SAM Biology. So again, with that, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Hopefully you learned a little bit about dragonflies. They're worthy of appreciation. That's the most important message that I can give you. So I will stop sharing my screen now. Sam, we have one question. How long do dragonflies live? A great question. So dragonflies at their various stages of life can have different uh, lifespans. So for some, like the common uh, darner, the common green darner, they can live for five years as aquatic naiads. Now, some of you may remember February of last year and the brutal freeze that we had. And, you know, a lot of our ponds froze over, the streams froze over. Where does a baby dragonfly go in those cases? It goes to the bottom. It goes very, very close to the bottom of that. The temperature of the water, water is relatively uh, the same. So they can persist for years, even despite our frigid, frigid winters uh, in, in the aquatic stage. So for some of them, it can be multiple years, five years in the case of our green darners. Other ones will live just for a season. So they'll either overwinter as eggs or as the, the aquatic, aquatic naiad stage, but will just live for a season uh, there too. So to answer your question, long, long story short, uh, it varies. It varies on the species. Most of them won't live past a year but there are some of them in the aquatic stage that can last much longer. Well, we got two more questions about what's the best way to attract dragonflies to our yards and how could we create a habitat at home? A great question. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I love master gardeners. I love master naturalists. You people are my family, you're my friends. Um, you put in a lot of plants. You put in a lot of plants into your landscape. I would argue that you're not just doing that for you, you're doing it for the ecosystem. One of the best things you can do is diversity. Diversity of plants in your landscaping, in your yard, bring a diversity of bugs. And those diversity of bugs bring a diversity of the predators of those bugs. So it brings those dragonflies. So they are, um, the diversity of plants really is the foundation of the ecosystem, even in our yards. So that's one way to attract a variety of bugs, including dragonflies. If you do have water features, if you have a koi pond, or if you have some sort of water feature in your yard, one of the best ways to attract dragonflies actually is to have some aquatic vegetation. So vegetation that goes into the water. Some people say, well, you know, I've got a bird bath and there's some water in that. Will that attract dragonflies? Well, not really. It doesn't really attract dragonflies. It may attract bugs that in turn attract dragonflies, but it probably doesn't attract the whole, the entire life cycle of our dragonflies, our bird bath. If you have those other aquatic features, putting in some aquatic vegetation is the key for our dragonflies. It brings the aquatic bugs, which are fed on by the aquatic uh, naiad stage. We got right. another person talking here that their, her husband can get them to land on his finger. What is attracting them to him? So that's got to be good luck. I don't know. Is, is it like five years of good luck? I don't know. It's got to be five years of good luck if a dragonfly lands on you. Um, he probably has patience. Patience is probably the big thing that he probably has. Uh, you know, maybe patience just for dragonflies. I'm not sure. But I've done this too. If you sit by a stream and put your little finger up, they will find that perch. They'll find that perch. It may take a bit of sitting. And right now that's hard to sit outside for 100 degrees. But if you take a little bit of patience and a finger sticking out, sometimes they will land upon your finger. So dragonflies as aerial predators, they're looking for that perch. They're looking for that lookout, that watchtower that they can see far off for potential prey. Any other questions or comments? Oh, here's one. If you use dunks in your water feature, will it cause problems for dragonflies? A great question. So uh, these dunks, 
have a little bacteria that feed on some of the other aquatic bugs. People use them for mosquitoes, for the mosquito larva. Yeah, uh, it may not kill the dragonflies, but it'll kill their food. So it is one of those things that, you know, the dunks, they are doing some good of controlling the, the mosquito populations, the mosquito larva, but they're also controlling the food for our mosquitoes. So it is that trade-off there to play with uh, too. So yeah, they probably are impacting uh, the dragonflies a bit as well. well I, don't see, I don't see questions. I see comments though. I think we've got people liking you. Fascinating. Good. Terrific presentation. Excellent. I mean, and and Joelle, do you, Joelle, do you remember the homework assignment? I do remember the homework assignment. Sit by water. Sit by water. There you go. And Perfect. See, sit see, by water. If you can find time. water, sit by it. Yeah, sit by it these days. Um, <laughs> sit by it. The, the homework, yes. Go outside, sit by some water, and look for some of the dragonflies. If you don't know the names of the dragonflies, that's okay. See if you can find five different types or shapes or sizes of them. It's a lot of fun. Does anybody else have We, we got thanks. I don't know, Abby, you want to finish up here? Sure. Sam, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And uh, I don't know where water is really close. I know where there's a creek, but I don't know if I can get down to it. <laughs> But okay, well, thank you so very much. This has been just wonderful, and I'm, I'm glad you're feeling better. So, um, next, I would like to introduce um, Lois Diggs, and she's going to present our project spotlight on Moss Haven Elementary. So, Lois, you want to go ahead and uh, log on? Uh, yeah. There you Can are. You see me? Yes, we can. All right, here we go. Okay. Begin from the beginning. Okay, it is always so good to hear Sam. Um, I have to tell you, after him, I feel like I'm like, you know, blah, but uh, <laughs> it's so fun. Um, but for right now, I'm going to take about 10 minutes of your time because I want to introduce you to my real passion of Moss Haven Elementary's farm. And I have been involved with this project for 10 years from the very beginning. So our um, school project is located at 9202 Moss Farm Lane. Reason is called Moss Farm Lane is because the Moss Farm and the Moss family developed that whole area that we live in right here. And so um, let me just tell you that there are three people who are the project coordinators, Patty Brewer, myself, and Maureen O'Hanahan. And we have been in existence for 10 years. Um, we're a partnership with the Master Gardeners, the Certified Schoolyard Habitat, Monarch Way Station, a lot of other things. But the main thing is that <clears throat> 10 years ago, there was uh, a teacher, a special ed teacher, her name is Kim Almond, and some kindergarten parents. And they said they wanted to have an opportunity for their kids to learn more about where their food came from, um, really good practices of what to do. And so they looked around behind the school and there was this big open field. So they put in four beds um, and they realized almost immediately back um, 10 years ago that this wasn't gonna work. So what they did is they contacted the Master Gardeners and we came and helped. And over 10 years, what has happened is we have developed this wonderful area. And so right now on our 10th anniversary, we put in, because we got tired of putting in the wood raised beds that every two, three years they rot, you have to put them back in. We put in new um, Vigo beds. Um, you'll see some pictures of it later as I go through the slide. We have three herb beds um, that we use during some lessons and also for parents and others who come to the farm to um, potentially pick. We have a pollinator garden, a Texas history plot that we put the three sisters in for another lesson, Blackland uh, Pocket Prairie. We have a three bin compost area that a Boy Scout helped re, um, reconfigure for us. A 25 by 45 giveaway plot. Um, we've donated over 15,000 pounds of food over the years. We have a chicken coop, which is like our mm, positive, really great thing with the run. There's a 4-H club for after school, meets once a month on a Friday afternoon. And we have a summer camp and way more things going on. So let me just have you look at these fabulous pictures for a minute. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a 
uh, synopsis of Moss Haven. We have at least 500 students in the school. They are kindergarten to sixth grade. Next year, our sixth graders will be going to a middle school and we will only be kindergarten through fifth. The thing that makes us unique, not only our chickens, but is that from the very beginning, they worked with the students, working with the parents, with the, um, the faculty, the principal, all the powers that be in Richardson School District to incorporate the farm as a curriculum in the school. So these kids come out every week, uh, barring weather problems or testing and other things, um, either Monday or Tuesday or Friday. And there is a specific curriculum that we work out on the farm. Now, we as Master Gardeners do not do this all the time. We only do about six lessons a year because there are actual, <clears throat> excuse me, farm teachers, we will call them. And that um, they are um, working with Kim Almond. And there's a picture you'll see right here, over here. There's Kim at our farmer's market. And they work um, with the faculty at the school to develop the curriculum so that it interwinds or it uh, interplays. Not everything is going to be exact excuse me, exact, but we try to make sure that it helps accentuate what they're learning in the classroom and not just come out, um, weed something, water, and go back in. The students also are aware that um, they come out on a regular basis with their teachers in a whole different way, to read something, to draw art, to um, do anything. So the farm has become a very integral part of not only the school, but the whole neighborhood. We have a fourth of a mile track that they use in PE, but also parents little strolling, you know, taking their kids in the strollers. People run it. Um, it's open. You can come to the farm anytime during the day, um, sunrise to sunset. We just ask that people please pick up after their dogs. Um, so these are just some of our master gardeners who have helped um, pick our amazing crop of um, cauliflower and broccoli one year. And so let me just give you a little bit more info as what we as master gardeners do besides helping with six lessons through the years is that we have a black land pocket prairie. And the reason I'm starting with this is this is my favorite thing. I helped really get this going. And it is um, the five main grasses, your big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian side of crama, which is our staked grass, switch grass. Um, there's another one in there that I just lost. Anyway, um, seasonal wildflowers. We have native milkweed. We have a lesson on the Blackland Prairie ecoregion. We plant the blue bonnet specifically in the fall to talk about the whole thing of the state um, flower and it's a reseeding annual. We give out seeds because we collect them. So it's just a really fun place to be. And we had a work day this morning with a few of our master gardeners and it's really hot out there, but um, we're getting prepared for planting our blue bonnet seeds. And um, so we're getting ready. We also have a pollinator plot and it's at the back of the um, garden. And the whole idea for that is to help us have our hummingbirds specifically for the Turk's cap. As we all know, Turk's cap is, um, is fertilized or is pollinated, excuse me, by a uh, hummingbird. And we won't go into the details, but I'm sure y'all are all aware of it. It is uh, a red one. I'm trying to get the pink and the peach also. And we use this um, specifically in the fall because I'm an entomology specialist. And um, what that means is I really am adamant on us um, being aware of monarchs. So the kids get to tag monarchs. We get to track them. We've participated in this for many years. And Kim actually got to go down and see in Mexico the migration location. And so it's just another means of the kids learning not just how their food is is grown, but why the interplay between insects and everything in nature. Um, the last thing that's really, really fun is the 4-H club. Now, we don't do as much as maybe we would want because they meet, as I say, on Fridays once a month. But um, they not only do our chicken uh, involvement in the coop, but they also are very involved in doing photography, uh, public speaking, art, um, you name it, they've got a whole nother curriculum. But the one thing we do help is those students who want to make the commitment, and it is a true commitment, to participate in competition at the state fair with the chicken. They actually kind of get to pick their chicken or the chicken picks them. They have to learn all about the breed. They have to learn all, every kind of question they could be asked. They have to answer that. So we haven't done this for two years. And this year, um, this last spring, 
our master gardener who has a real passion for poultry uh, developed a private competition for our students. And as you can see in our pictures, um, they had a great time. They um, got to answer all the questions, they got all their ribbons and they were recognized at our 10th anniversary this, um, this um, spring as right before school closed. Uh, just a little things about our chickens is the kids get to vote on their names. Vanilla, who is a Delaware breed, who is one of the larger chickens, is the queen right now, may change as we get into this new year. Um, they're 18, standard size, and bantam. Now the girls sitting down here with the little chickens, those are bantams, and those are the smaller chickens that actually produce or lay that little teeny egg. We do have lessons once in a while on chickens because it's, it's interesting how people, even adults, don't understand maybe like how do they lay an egg and without a rooster and little things like that. So we definitely have some chicken lessons and also we have some of the best compost because we change out all that bedding. It goes to our compost and it's amazing. It just keeps things growing so well. Um, the one good thing is, um, I don't know, one of the many, is the parents and the kids get to volunteer to take care of the chickens in the coop during the week and on the weekend and they get to harvest the eggs and they lay an egg usually during the normal season, not so hot about every 23 hours. So they could come with 18 eggs every week. So, you know, it's it's uh, uh, more than that. So it's a lot of fun. Um, the future for us right now is uh, we're hoping come this fall, we'll get back into helping teach the kids. But the big thing at the end of the year is they give a little evaluation as to what was their best and exciting thing, what would they like to see on the farm, things like that. And the big thing they wanna know is why don't we have watermelon, cantaloupe? How about some, you know, other fruits? We can't do that because of the water and the seasonal thing, because we try to grow for the school year. But we do have blackberries. Um, we were just up trimming them this morning. Uh, I have uh, prickled fingers to prove it. And we have figs. Um, this tree over on the side of the, I guess your left side, that is our fig tree. It's huge. Um, and we're hoping to actually have fruit this year. We have a persimmon tree back by our um, uh, artwork back here. And the goal is we're going to have an edible forest behind the plots. So that's the goal we're hoping that the kids could then enjoy. So just to wrap this up, um, you're interested, you'd like to know more, you want to volunteer. We have monthly work days. Uh, Monday, I mean, uh, Thursday, first and third, and then monthly, we have the community work days. That means all the people from the surrounding areas, some corporations, the high school kids come back who used to have be, come to Moss Haven. Um, you can volunteer to help with just maintaining our areas or with the kids. And I just added this slide because you can actually go into our VMS program. And if you haven't done this before, if you want to sign up for any project, when you go in as a master gardener and clock your hours, you're going to sign in and you're going to come to this first general slide over here with number one. If you'll click on general information, it's going to take you down to list of projects. Right there, there's a drop down menu and you can click on projects. Under here, you're going to do a search and it says Moss Haven or say school gardens. And it'll come up and we're number 214. When you click 214, it's going to come up to this wonderful description. Now, I've cut off the bottom because there's a lot of Master Gardener names that may be, and I just don't want to share those. But as you scroll down to the bottom of this page, it allows you to click and volunteer for this project. It also allows you to put in some text where if you want to say, can't wait to help with the chickens, uh, what can I do for whatever, fill all that in, click you know, a volunteer, it will generate an email to me and we will get you on our list. We will keep you involved. We will do anything you uh, need to work with you to help you come out and volunteer. So that's our project. That's Moss Haven Farm. If anybody has any questions, you can even go to this site and put it at the bottom. And even if you maybe aren't volunteering, you could still ask a question and I'll get back with you. Um, so I'll give this back to Abby, I'll stop sharing. And if anybody has any questions, put it in the chat or hope to see you. We won't be meeting the Thursday because I'm leaving, my daughter's having a baby. And so I'm leaving as of Sunday. So uh, we'll keep you informed though. Just let us know you're interested. Thank Super you. Lois, Lois, before you get off, I've got two quick comments. Um, yes. First off, you mentioned at the beginning that you guys donate food that you grow there. Does it yes. go home to the kiddos or do you have a, 
an organization we, that you donate to? Well, the row crops go to the giveaway garden. That's the whole premise between the 25, 45 foot. All those go to uh, the food, the North Texas Food Bank or the Network of Community Ministries that gives to the Richardson School District. There's also a food banks with the Episcopal Church down the road from us. Um, but we do have, as you saw in the beginning, there was a picture with Kim Almond with a sign that said um, Farmers, Farmers Market. Market. Periodically, we have where the kids have to purchase their food on the last day of the week and they have to have a talent or a joke or a we've had some of the best comedians ever out there or they do a little jump anything and then uh, if we have funds we purchase a few other things to supplement but they take onions garlic anything kale that we have and they can take it home they can actually sample things and we do have a lot of sampling of food on the um farm uh we as master gardeners can't help with that unless we're um food what is it food safety certified which i am but i can't always be there so but yeah we um we don't want them just to learn about it we want them to taste it and the herbs go home at thanksgiving we do a whole herb lesson and send them herb bundles okay i can't okay i'll stop i know once you get started you can't stop you just right, right. yeah yeah okay that, that's called being oh. a master gardener you just oh. want to give back Okay, so, Lois, that was very good. And thank you so very much. I interrupt here for a second. Lois, there's one question we have. What are you using for the forms instead of wood? What are we using for the what? For oh, the, so the, Vigo, the Vigo beds. Yeah, they're Vigo beds. You actually go to Vigo, B-E-G-O garden. And that's the actual name. Do a Google search. Um, I think even if there is a um, uh, on our spotlight uh, information, on the website that's for public. I think even in our, I have our text in front of me, we have a site where you just go to vigogarden.com and that will and go to the, yeah. Mark, they come Mark, Jones, I'm Mark, sorry. Jones, Mark Jones, who's in charge of our community projects, he has a contact through the uh, pro procurement manager directly right. to Vigo and we get a discount. So right. contact right. Mark Jones, if you're interested in purchasing Vigo bits. Yeah, and they're very easy. You can't get them too much bigger. We had to stick with the 12 by 8. If you, you can, we did square 4 by 4, but we have a few beds that are huge, and those are too big, so those are still wood, but those, um, they're amazing, and we're hoping. I didn't note there was a picture of a bunny in my fruit slide, um, yeah. so we're hoping that even though we love the bunnies, that they will stay out of the beds because it's higher now, so nope. they've been eating all our seedlings, but just- nope. Nope, you you won't have that luck because we have bunnies in the in the Vigo beds at ring catchers. So. All right, well, never mind. Well, never then. mind. Right. We'll oh. get out the mesh again. And one okay. other reminder, Lois, you might want to look at the chat because you got a couple of nice comments there. Oh, thank you. Well, um, great comments, but come on out and have fun. All right. So thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Um, this brings us to the end of a meeting. Um, I wanted to go ahead and remind everybody that uh, we will have no meeting in August, but we will have a meeting in September. And it will be uh, Dr. Uh, George Diggs from Austin College, and he will be speaking on Ferns of Texas. Um, and uh, yes. Abby, Zondra would like to talk about nomination. Oh. oh, yes, please. Zondra, jump in there. Hi, everybody. Um, part of my responsibilities as immediate past president on the board is that I am the chairperson of the nominations committee. And it, according to the bylaws, um, the board bylaws, uh, in August, the members should get a call for nominations. So since we had this uh, meeting in August, this was very appropriate. I wanted to make sure that uh, you understood that we have 14 positions up for um, vote sometime, uh, in the meeting in October. Those positions are president, treasurer, secretary, First vice president in charge of fundraising, second uh, vice president in, in charge of membership and monthly meetings, and two 
uh, director at large positions, uh, so two out of the four. So that is seven major voting members for the, um, for the board. The other seven uh, are the uh, Texas Master Gardener Association director. There's two positions. Uh, those uh, actually uh, go to the meetings that are quarterly. It, they're all Zoom, so uh, right now. And then there's TMGA uh, alternate directors that in case one cannot be on there, uh, there'll be someone, there'll be. The reason why we have to have that is because we get two votes if they're voting. Uh, the other is one financial review committee member and the other two are, um, our nominations committee members. If you'd like more information, please uh, call me uh, or I'll, I'll put my phone number and my email in, in the chat. I'll be, uh, I would love for you to ask, ask me questions or if you're interested uh, so that we can get on with this uh, because we have so many um, uh, uh, positions that we have to uh, do it was earlier the better that we get you involved and in, and in getting information out to you. So um, you know the nominations committee members currently are Jan Weir, Ann Rogers, Lena Godat, and um, Vicki Cartwright. And we want to say this: we are grateful just for your thoughtful consideration in joining the DCMGA board of officers and directors. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Zandra. I'm, I'm glad you, uh, very timely, very timely. Um, Joellen, is there anything else? Uh, no, no, I'm not aware of anything else. Okay, all righty. Well, thank you so much. And uh, like Joellen had said, this is gonna be posted to YouTube. So we'll be able to enjoy Sam once again, if we want. And um, thank you very much to everybody for all you do and have a good rest of your day. So, bye-bye.